Hi everyone, this is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. In just about five minutes, Ranger Russ from Katmai National Park will be joining me and we'll be doing a live chat, answer your questions about September and Brooks River and talk about some of the different dynamics that we can expect to see this month. So please stand by and we will be with you in just a moment. Hi everyone, this is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. In just a couple of minutes at the top of the hour, Ranger Russ Taylor from Katmai National Park will be joining me. We're gonna be talking about September at Brooks River, the different dynamics that we can expect to see with bears and salmon, and answer your viewer questions. So please stand by, we'll be with you in just a moment. <laughs> We're broadcasting. All right. Ready when you. Have you zoomed out? Sure. Welcome to Katmai National Park in Brooks River. My name is Mike Fitz, and I'm a fellow with Explore.org. My name is Russ Taylor, and I'm a park ranger here in Katmai National Park. Welcome to this latest live chat brought to you by Katmai National Park and Explore.org. Over the next hour, we're going to talk about uh, several different things. Mm -hmm. uh, September is a pretty exciting time of the year here at Brooks River. We're also going to try to answer your viewer questions. Uh, if you're not familiar with this place, though, Katmai National Park is located about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And we're almost that smack dab right in the center of the park. And this is also a fairly special year for Katmai. It is. Yeah. This is our centennial year. We became a national monument in 1918 under Woodrow Wilson and expanded to a national park in 1980. 
and we celebrate that 100 years this year. Yeah, so it's really great to sort of celebrate the centennial of Katmai uh, this year through a variety of programs, and there's a few more special events coming up later in the year, uh, and uh, explore so, some of the ways that Katmai has changed over the years. It, indeed, it has, and yeah, we'll have a special <laughs> event in uh, Naknek on the 22nd of September for those that can join us there. So uh, this this month, though, at, at Brooks River, like I mentioned before, is a, a fairly exciting time. Uh, we have what we kind of consider the second peak season of bear activity happening right now. Oh, yeah. In some ways, yeah. <laughs> some ways, maybe even bigger than July some years. So we'll, we're going to talk about a lot of those different dynamics that you can expect to see, or at mm -hmm. least that based on our experience in the past, mm -hmm. uh, during the month of September, and maybe some of the differences that we could be witnessing right now, because we think uh, some of the things, perhaps, mm -hmm. some of those, what we will quote unquote call normal mm -hmm. in the past, some of those things might be changing. We don't really know, but we're going to try to speculate on, on a lot of those things uh, during the chat this afternoon. If you have questions for us, uh, mm -hmm. please go to explore.org or if you're watching on Facebook Live, um, both of those uh, pages have a commenting feature so you can drop your question in there and there's a, a couple helpful moderators from explore.org that will be sending us those questions. So we'll try to get to those a little bit later in the chat. Uh, but September, I think, in, in one way is uh, a, a time of the year where we can really uh, observe the the profound hunger that bears experience and a lot of their behaviors uh, that we see at this time of the year is mm -hmm. explained by that profound hunger and also it's it's definitely a, a time of change um, maybe the a time of change for how we uh, or how the bears are using Brooks River it's it's a season of change things are starting to slow down as far as productivity in the ecosystem mm -hmm. coming from you know late summer into fall into right. winter very quickly around here and that really had um, one of those big signs, I guess we could say, of, of, of change here right now is what the salmon are doing. That's true. Yeah. It all starts with the salmon. Of course, the bears wouldn't even be here without the salmon. Uh, salmon, uh, when they spawn, they, they tend to be born around January and they live in the gravel bars of the river for about four months. And then the young salmon then in that spring will head into Naknek Lake where they'll live for one or two years and they'll feed there and salmon have a unique life and that they then head out into the Bristol Bay and into the ocean for about two to three years where they'll feed there. Uh, after that time, then they'll go as far south as Oregon, possibly that far out in the ocean, big swirls, and then come back into Bristol Bay and they'll go back to their natal stream to spawn, and that's this time of year. Uh, by September, they've laid their eggs and they actually begin a die off. And so we're now in that process where the salmon are beginning to die. Uh, and in the next couple weeks, that will happen in mass. And the bears generally gather in the lower part of the river. Uh, we've seen the bears uh, in previous Septembers, uh, the river some years it's lower, but the salmon are easier to catch down here. Uh, one of the differences could be this year that you're referring to, Mike, is uh, we have a large run of silver salmon this year. And it seems like that uh, has extended the stay at the falls. So we've seen bears, not only was it an unusual August with bears being at the falls, it's an unusual September too, because many bears had been in the falls and it's looked like a miniature version of July up there this September so far. That's really unusual for us. So what would a, a typical September scene look like around here? If we kind of discount maybe some of those, those differences that we're seeing this year okay what, how would you sort of describe if someone has never been here before a, a typical september day what would the bears be doing okay uh, well <laughs> one is the bears are going to be nice and fluffy and fat looking already okay uh, yeah. they've got their winter coats have come in so they're very very big looking bears especially compared to july uh, most of them are going to be you're going to see them snorkeling in the river looking around for dying salmon Dying salmon are a lot easier to catch than they are when they're active, of course, and energetic. And so the, sam the bears will just be snorkeling, looking in the water for those fish. You'll see them in the lake behind us, uh, just swimming a lot. Sometimes I say that uh, after being in Katmai, I think bears are aquatic animals as much as they are land animals. Here they spend a, a large amount of time in the water just looking for dead and dying salmon this time of year. The other thing that's happening is they're extraordinarily hungry. 
they are going into hyperphagia. So when we eat as humans and we get full, our bodies have a chemical that tell us, tells us you're full, it's time to stop eating. For the bears, as they get into the fall, that switches off. And all of a sudden, they no longer feel that they're full. And the bears appear ravenous, and they are just eating everything in sight. They're eating salmon now that they would never eat in July. You know, in July they might high grade and they're gonna eat the brains and the skin, and maybe some eggs, and they're gonna eat the fattiest parts of the salmon. Where now we get into September and they're eating the salmon that might have seemed less desirable before, but because they're in hyperphagia, they're gonna eat everything. It's, yeah, it's not too common for these carcasses that are in the water to go completely unscavenged. At least part of them will be eaten mm -hmm. because they do they 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 can aff less afford to be choosy as the season progresses because right now maybe some bears are still catching fresher fish mm -hmm. but all of those fish are eventually going to spawn and die just because we had like a really large run of of fish this year sockeye and probably silver salmon too mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mean that the fresher fish will be around any longer in the in the season true yeah the die off may be about the same time there's a, a lot of those fish, they, they time their spawning based on sort of like water temperature. Mm -hmm. Water temperature is the thing that really uh, dictates the incubation period for the eggs. Mm -hmm. So when the water temperature reaches a certain point, the salmon got to spawn. Because if you spawn a little bit too late, maybe your eggs don't hatch at the right time. Or right. if you spawn too early, they could hatch too early. And Something those like eggs that. are already against all odds to make it back. About 1% are even going to make the entire cycle all the way back up to spawn and only about 10% of the eggs that get laid here will even, even hatch. Uh, you've got about one salmon might lay up to 4,500 eggs and you're looking at about 10% making it. Yeah. And Brooks River has a, a different dynamic as well compared to a lot of other salmon streams in, in Katmai because mm -hmm. most of those other streams in Katmai, the salmon move in, they spawn and that's it. And it happens all within a few short weeks, mm -hmm. sometimes like less than two weeks, three mm -hmm. weeks at most even for some of the sizable streams around here. But we see salmon become accessible, accessible to bears here at the beginning of uh, July, sometimes right. you know late, uh, late June in many instances. Mm -hmm. And they're still accessible to bears, mm -hmm. just in a different way, coming up in, uh, you know, sometimes towards the middle of October even. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing uh, one of the dynamics we're seeing now today, we had our first mother bear return, uh, 435 Holly that a lot of people know has returned this time of year. Uh, we expect more family groups to return to the river. Uh, we did have the one bear we're all kind of waiting on is uh, 410. We haven't seen her yet this fall and should be about this time that she would return if she does. Being a 29 year old bear, she may, you know, she may not return. We'll see. Yeah, and she might, you know, have found, hey, this is, there's another place for me to, to make a living where I don't have to compete with people and vehicles and airplanes and other bears importantly true uh, so you know bears uh, have the ability to change their habits they're certainly not automatons where it's just pure instinct mm. they make decisions it's pretty uh we, when we were able to watch these we're very fortunate to be here and to be able to watch them we can see the individuality in these bears mm -hmm. now they do kind of make decisions about how they want to make a living it's very different for each and every one of these bears changes uh, from the beginning of summer until the, the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about scavenging behavior. That's not something that we see as much mm -hmm. in July because there's not a lot of dead fish around and the bears know that. But if they were, you know, if they couldn't make a decision mm -hmm. about how to fish, if they only knew one technique, you know, they'd be swimming around the mouth of the river here and they would probably not find much to right. make a living with in, in July. But coming up in a, later in the year, it's much easier for them. Uh, to to make that living by by scavenging and that snorkeling technique that you mentioned before mm -hmm. is something that pretty much every bear you uses at some point in the fall it's a, right. almost like a universal fishing te technique mm -hmm. we sometimes talk about how some bears will steal fish some bears are are good are better at chasing fish um, some bears uh, you know are really patient but the mm -hmm. Once the salmon spawn and die, that scavenging technique is almost exclusively a snorkeling. Right. And mm -hmm. some bears will even swim down beneath the surface and grab one off the bottom. So you actually will get some full out swims mm -hmm. out of these bears as well. During the chat today, too, um, you know, we're probably going to mention maybe different nicknames for bears or different numbers. And mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with the individual animals here at the river, if you go to Katmai's website, 
there is a a, a section for ebooks, and you can download the uh, Bears of Brooks River ebook. Uh, so the Rangers here put that together each mm-hmm. and every year. It's a great identification guide. It has a lot of wonderful information about the uh, ecology and the natural history history of, of of brown bears here. So there's a link for that on explore.org's uh, any of the bear cam pages on explore.org. If you scroll down below the live cam feed, you can find that on the left hand side, or just go to a search engine, type in cat my ebook, and it'll probably be the first hit for you. So that's right, and it'll tell you about bears like 879 who returned about a week ago and. We saw all of a sudden here's a bear, and if you look in the bear book, you see that 879 tends to only be seen around Brooks uh, Camp in the fall. And sure enough, as soon as we saw that bear, we said, well, fall must be here. And it gives you all kind of details about those bears, from when they were born, how many litters they've had. It's quite a great resource. And those those bears that I see or that we see only in the fall those those ones really do signal to me like the end of summer mm-hmm. a, a lot mo- i should say maybe most of the bears that we see at brooks river will come in july mm-hmm. and the fall but there are some bears that only come in the fall we mm-hmm. don't know what those other bears are doing in july maybe mm-hmm. they haven't got the message to come here <laughs> or they, they're making a living somewhere sure uh, we we've seen some bears recently that l- like brooks camp uh, over at Margot Creek and maybe they'll stay there this fall or possibly they'll come on here in another few days. So yeah you can look for these um, if you're a longtime cam viewer uh, and or you just started this summer and you got familiar with a lot of the bears that were here in July you now have an opportunity to learn a different subset of bears right here in in September so uh, it's it's an exciting time of the year definitely a, a a changing dynamic um, you mentioned a little bit about hyperphagia, mm-hmm. and I think before we get into our, our next topic and get to questions, I did want to touch back on hyperphagia. Sure. Because when, when, underst- when, when we understand how hyperphagia and that excessive eating uh, affects the animals, it can really help us to explain and understand their behavior just that much more. True. So it's a, it's an you mentioned before a, a period of excessive eating mm-hmm. uh, and so it's a behavior that we can see that's right it's also a physiological change mm-hmm. that they have as well it's almost an overwhelming urge to eat i don't think people really experience hunger in the ways that bears do because they need to eat a year's worth of food in six months or less or even even with extreme hunger we eat you know we may gorge ourselves we're still going to get full at some point and say that's enough it's hard to imagine not reaching that point and just your body saying, continue to eat. And for mother bears particularly, this is incredibly important. September, October is probably the most critical point where they're gonna gain the most amount of their weight. And that's gonna determine whether or not they can have cubs in the den that winter. So the, you're just gonna see them eating everything they can to pack on as many calories as possible. So yeah, when you when you're uh, watching the bears at Brooks River, make sure that you're, um, you know, you're paying attention to how long they're in the water, mm-hmm. uh, and <laughs> and of course how how many fish they're eating. Sometimes the cams are able to follow a, a bear for a significant period of time, and mm-hmm. in the lower river down here, this is a very productive place it sure is. for um, for brown bears to catch salmon late in the season. And in fact, it's actually more productive mm-hmm. up th- than up at Brooks Falls as far as catch rates goes. So once those the, the the main food source here at Brooks River becomes spawned out salmon, this is really the place to be. Yeah, you'll see a bear uh, catch a fish, kind of float on its back and eat it for a while, discard it and immediately come up with another one. It is pretty remarkable. Uh, and occasionally I like to, s- to stand on this platform down here and count the number of fish that certain bears are catching. I might watch them over, if they're in, in view over an hour mm-hmm. or something like that. And it's it's not uncommon for bears to find 30 salmon carcasses in an hour um, so uh, what I can't tell is how much of the fish that they're actually eating because they they looks a lot of times it looks like they're eating the full thing but they drop um, a lot of it in, into the water yeah there's times they they like a piece and there's times even even they not being picky eaters there's still times where they'll give one up yeah but those fish still over time um, give bears a tremendous amount of energy a tremendous amount of calories Mm-hmm. Uh, spawned out fish are not nearly as uh, valuable calorically as a fresh uh, fish right. from the ocean. They probably contain half the, the calories they do when the, compared to when they first arrive because mm-hmm. salmon, when they first come back, aren't eating uh, to replenish those lost energy reserves. 
But when you can catch, you know, 30 fish easily in a day, I mean, still you're gaining thousands and thousands of calories. Oh, you yeah. don't have to work very hard for it either. Yeah, 28 hamburgers, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it'd be like, you know. Uh, we'd have to eat so many, so many s burgers in a day to keep up with what bears get calorie-wise. And when you do, <laughs> yeah, when you do the math, I mean, it is kind of incredible how many calories they're taking in per day. <laughs> right. Like, oh, sometimes over a hundred thousand calories yeah. in some instances. When you count fish mm -hmm. and you calculate how many calories are in those fish on average, it is really amazing. And I, it's just something that I cannot fathom doing. But no. again, bears are remarkable creatures. They, their physiology is different than ours in a lot of different ways. So uh, fascinating to watch here on, on the cams. And it's all about survival. You know, you've got to, they've got to get the calories in order to survive, not only the winter, but also the following spring. Uh, they've got to have energy still to mate in the following spring. And so they need those calories just to survive. And speaking of, of survival, um, they're uh, I'm wondering, and we were talking a little bit about this, you know, this morning um, before the broadcast. I I'm wondering about whether we could be seeing some some uh, shifting trends with how bears make a living here at the river to survive. Um, because this August, uh, we saw an incredible number of bears at Brooks Falls and elsewhere on the river. I wasn't here during August. I mm -hmm. was, you know, working from, from home um, in, in Washington State. Uh, but watching the cams I mean, sometimes I would see like 10 bears fishing the falls and it's like August 15th and if you're not familiar mm -hmm. with um, with Brooks River that really sort of is a uh, it's something unprecedented it's never it's not something that I've, I I had ever seen uh, before within my experience yeah just yeah. being an eyewitness to it last season and then this season last year in August there was definitely a time for a couple of weeks in mid-August where we really didn't see bears hardly at all. You'd see a, an occasional bear, one, maybe one bear at the falls that, hanging around, maybe a few bears in the lower river at, at the most. Uh, this year, going up to the falls in August, I never stopped going because each night there were three, five, seven bears. It never ended. It was truly uh, complete opposite of a year ago. Uh, and so, so I know something is very different this year. Whether it's an anomaly or it's a continuing trend, we'll have to watch and find out. And that's what I'm very curious to kind of find out. And I guess I just have to be patient. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like Otis sitting at the falls. I just have to <laughs> wait for my answers to come to me. Uh, because, I, th you know, we, we saw some bears fishing the falls last year, which is uncommon. Mm -hmm. uh, there definitely have been years that when I worked here as a ranger at Brooks River that I would, we wouldn't see really any bears at, mm -hmm. the, at the waterfall. We, right. uh, sometimes it would go like two weeks without seeing um, more than a, a couple of bears at Brooks River in the middle of August. So things are, are changing. We're not really sure why. You know, you can you know, think of the obvious though, that mm -hmm. it has to do with salmon, obviously. Yep. If salmon weren't available here, the bears wouldn't be here. They would all have moved on to different places. And most of the bears, I should note importantly, did move on to other places because we weren't seeing like the full July numbers. Right. Um, which there probably were over 50 individual bears counted in in July here at Brooks River. So we weren't seeing that many. Or, or Certainly not, yeah. no. We saw a few uh, that stayed around. Uh, for those that have been watching the cams for a while, 151 was around every day. 503 was around every day. We saw them with great regularity. Uh, but it could be, some of it could play be the fact that we've had a historic salmon run for two years back to back. And you had noted uh, the silver salmon run seems to be lasting longer uh, salmon jumping even into October which is really unusual uh, to me and so it could be a different type of salmon running and lengthening the run it could also just be that it's two years of great numbers and maybe in a couple of years it goes back to what it was we, we don't know yet yeah it, it, we don't we don't uh, and to give everyone at home a little bit of background information on uh, the types of salmon that we have here. Historically, um, bears here at Brooks River have fed almost exclusively on sockeye salmon. That's right. So sockeye salmon will arrive uh, sometime in, in late June in large numbers, become accessible to bears as they're migrating, as the, as the salmon are migrating upstream. Brooks Falls is a temporary barrier to migrating salmon. So if you're a bear, you can stand there, you can wait for the, for the fish 
to jump through your mouth if you're standing on top of the waterfall. Hmm. If you're standing or if you're sitting below, you can wait for salmon to swim you know, right down below you, you yeah. and, and, and catch them that way. But usually what happened in August is the sockeye would stop migrating. That was kind of the end of their, their movements through the river. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would just stage uh, for several weeks waiting for the right time to spawn. And during that time period, there were low densities of fish and the fish were still fairly high in energy as far mm -hmm. as like their ability to swim. So they, right. you know, they hadn't started to spawn yet, so they still had a lot of energy to move around, evade predators. So when you have low densities of fish and, and fish that can swim away, you know, it's harder to catch. Exactly, it's hard. It's hard to catch. Uh, but what we saw this year is it seems like uh, the the number of the migrating salmon in Brooks River really never stopped. They just kept on going, and they seem like they're still going today. Too. They they are, yeah. Um, I because we still are seeing. Uh, uh, a noticeable number of salmon jumping at Brooks Falls. And it may go in a cycle. There may be some quiet hours, but then there'll be an hour where there's 13 fish jumping per minute, you know, so, and more. And there's a bit of mystery involved in this too, because uh, while sockeye salmon in Bristol Bay are, Bristol Bay are, um, uh, the numbers of them are very carefully counted mm -hmm. to make sure that the fishery uh, is is managed sustainably. Mm -hmm. uh, the the silver salmon, also called coho, if you're from a different part of the, you know, right. the United States, that's a different name for them. Those fish aren't um, caught um, commercially mm -hmm. uh, in in this sort of like area of of Bristol Bay. So their numbers aren't really tracked as they're moving into Naknek River. So we don't know how many of those silver salmon. Are coming in on a yearly basis could be a few thousand but uh it we think possibly because there was a weir here at brooks river in mm -hmm. the 50s and 60s and they did count some silver salmon coming through then but it was really a low number it wasn't like what we saw this august and what is still kind of continuing now and, and this i know for mm -hmm. sure watching bears last august even if they were at the falls i there was no chance to get that classic shot of a bear standing on the lip of the falls, catching a fish after July last year. This year, it's happening today. Even today, a little earlier, and maybe even now, there are fish jumping, there's bears on the lip catching fish that are jumping. That did not happen a year ago. So, yeah. Or maybe <laughs> years previous to that. Right, and that's what I experienced too. Um, if you came in September, you were looking at fat bears scavenging fish. You Now we have the opportunity to see fat bears eating, you know, still, fresh migrating salmon. Uh, right. The majority of the fish that I'm seeing at, uh, at, uh, jumping at Brooks Falls are silver salmon. So I think it's it's mostly sort of that big push of that different species of fish that's changing mm -hmm. the game here for a lot of the bears at, 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 at the river. Uh, so a lot of bears can afford to make a living by standing at the waterfall mm -hmm. and doing quite well with it. Number 32, very fat, even though he hasn't been around very much. <laughs> right. Number 747, very fat. Uh, it's a very good year to be a brown bear here at Brooks River because <laughs> there is so much food available. Yeah, 747, <laughs> wow, enormous bear right now, really noticeable. So the, yeah, Brooks River here um, is, it's, it's a special place no matter what time of the year that you're here, but we do can kind of consider September to be that second season of bear activity. It it's a fun time of the year to watch on the cams, to see bears scavenging fish, to see that uh, a, a successful bear, uh, fat bears are successful bears. So when you're seeing these slow moving plotting animals on the bear cam, they are successful animals that are prepped um, well to survive the winter season. We're also seeing, uh, you know, a bunch of changes happening here. So it's it's really never the same place twice. It's true. And part of the changes that I'm liking, Mike, is yesterday I was up on Dumpling Mountain picking blueberries to my heart's content. And we've got the fall colors beginning to change and we're beginning to get sunrises and sunsets again at a, and stars. In the past week, week and a half, stars are appearing. So it's definitely fall is arriving and it's it's a wonderful time of season here. And we would like to, I think, uh, take the rest of the time during the chat to answer any viewer questions that you may have. So uh, I'm going to open up a slightly different app here. All right. We look forward to that. Yeah. And we're going to get to these questions. So we haven't looked at these ahead of time. So That's right. We'll see what surprises are in <laughs> store for us. <laughs> It's a dark secret that we skip all the really tough questions. <laughs> no, it's not a secret. <laughs> we do try to answer them all. We Oftentimes do. We don't, we, have, do. we don't have enough time, though. Um, so uh, we answered one of, the, one of the questions during the chat. Somebody was wondering, um, has 410 been spotted yet? And I, I have not heard of any 410 sightings. Not yet. No. Okay. Still waiting. Yeah, so again, she's an older adult female. 
the oldest known bear here at Brooks River. We did see her in late June, but we haven't seen her since. So she's off probably making a living somewhere else. And we're, if she comes back, we're eagerly looking forward to how well she's doing. That's right. And long bridge closures. <laughs> <laughs> she's also, yeah, Portan is also one of the most human habituated bears here. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about habituation with brown bears, it's, uh, it's basically them just getting used to something. Right. Uh, so they get, uh, some bears get used to the presence of people. Others never do. Mm -hmm. um, before 10, definitely is very used to the presence of people. She will sleep underneath the platform where we're standing. Mm -hmm. uh, she will sleep on the trails. She'll sleep on the beach where the planes land. So she is very, very used and to people. And nothing will so. bother her or wake her up. Right. You know, she's not bothered by anything anymore. She's she, been through it all. <laughs> she just does her thing. <laughs> uh, 410 doesn't have uh, cubs this year. Uh, but uh, somebody was wondering where do the bears with cubs go, uh, you know, at this time of the year or sort of like in the midsummer season? That's a great question, and it's one of those answers that we really don't know. And uh, we don't collar the bears or have any tracking devices on them here. We have done some of that on the coast where we watch migration patterns. We really don't know. We do sometimes see these bears at Margo Creek, which is about uh, just several miles away in Naknek Lake, and they're sometimes seen there. Uh, sometimes they're gonna get berries this time of year and just be off in other parts of the lake, other streams, And but what we really don't know. We just know that they tend to return in the fall, and again, 435 has come back just today, the first uh, cubs that we've seen return to this area. And right now, uh, I think I, I wanted to mention this during the chat, but I forgot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important to note that we're still at relatively low numbers of bears mm -hmm. um, compared to the peak that we're going to see in the fall. So bear numbers will continue to increase at Brooks River here through the month and really kind of peak around the end of September, early October. Uh, so if, if you're just seeing just a few bears on the cams right now, uh, you know, at Brooks Falls or in the mouth of the river, there's still a lot more that we can expect to show up. 410 could be one of those. A lot of those family groups that we ended up watching in July with, mm -hmm. with young cubs or older cubs, we can expect the, those to probably come back. Yeah, well. it seems like now, every day you turn the page of the calendar, there's another, another bear coming into the area. So, yeah, it's going to increase quickly. And like... Um, the last question, you know, wondering where do, you know, some of these other bears go? We really don't have a, a great answer uh, for that. But uh, how far do they travel to their dens is another kind of question that we, we don't have a good answer to. Because mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't really know where these specific bears will go to the den. We have a, a good idea uh, based on some tracking studies um, at Brooks River here in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And... Um, just other general studies about brown bears on the Alaska Peninsula. We know that bears will move to some slightly higher elevations that we're, uh, compared to where we are. Right now, mm -hmm. we're actually not very high above sea level. Yeah. We're only about like 60 feet or something mm -hmm. like that. So bears will move a little bit higher into the surrounding mountains to get to an area where there's uh, steep slopes mm -hmm. uh, on a slope with a lot of vegetation, and mm -hmm. they just dig their dens straight into the hillsides there. And some of them, we find some dens right up here on Dumpling Mountain. It's possible as far away as and further than the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Some of those bears tend to migrate up the valley road back towards us. So uh, just the surrounding area within within 60 miles almost certainly. Yeah, so it's hard for us to narrow it down, unfortunately. <laughs> right. uh, but yeah, they're, they're going to the, the surrounding mountains here. Uh, but somebody also, a follow-up to this one is somebody's wondering, do they reuse their dens? Uh, not so much in Katmai. They may in other areas, but here the dens uh, tend to lose integrity during the summer as, as water seeps into them, they collapse. So while it's not absolutely out of the question in general, they're going to dig a new den every year here. And we're about uh, halfway through our, our live chat. Um, we're going to spend the rest of the time trying to answer your viewer questions. Uh, just to reintroduce myself, in, uh, in case you joined us late, my name is uh, Mike Fitz, and I am a fellow with Explore.org. And my name is Russ Taylor, and I am a seasonal park ranger here in Katmai National Park. And again, if you do have questions for us, uh, please post those in the uh, comments, either on Explore.org or if you're watching on Facebook. Um, and the helpful moderators for Explore.org will copy those questions and send them to us. So uh, we can do our best to try to answer those. Uh, often... Uh, I think at best, um, 20 questions is about as most as we can answer, depending on how long we talk. Sure. Um, <laughs> some people 
not, um, <laughs> are a little longer winded than others. <laughs> we'll, we'll see uh, how many All we right. get through here. Uh, do uh, a curious question uh, about hibernation. Hmm. Uh, do bears ever go rogue and fail to hibernate? <laughs> I not that I'm aware. Right, of. right. Yeah, and I don't think they ever. Their metabolism is probably always really, really low, even if they stay active. I mean, there there are <laughs> records of bears even in Alaska, like on Kodiak Island, for instance, of bears staying active year round. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that there was a tracking, st well, at least one tracking study, a long term tracking study on Kodiak Island, and they found male brown bears were active. Um, you know, all months of the year. Mm -hmm. But in the winter time, January, February, they were really lethargic, mm -hmm. really slow moving. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were kind of in hibernative mode, even though they weren't in their dens. Okay. Uh, it's, and that's been documented in a couple other, or not a couple, but several other bear populations in North America. Right. Um, with, not just with, um, with, you know, bears on Kodiak, but also uh, black bears in California, mm -hmm. um, black bears in the southeastern United States. So if, if you're fat enough, the weather's kind of warm enough, you know, maybe you don't necessarily need to, to go into your den. Yeah. But if you're a mom with cubs, it changes the, the story though, right? Yeah, you yeah. Cert, well, you're gonna have your cubs in the den for one that first year, and then, uh, yeah, they would need to be with you in the den subsequent years. You'd have to hibernate then, but going rogue is an interesting <laughs> thought. <laughs> and uh, how long do they hibernate for? It can be anywhere from you know, three to five months, uh, depending on the age of the bear, how how well fed it is, whether it has cubs or not. Mm -hmm. Pregnant females are usually the bears that go into the den first, and they're the, um, if they give birth in the den, they they come out last. Mm -hmm. They really need to give um, their cubs extra time to grow in the den before those cubs are capable of keeping up with mother across the landscape. But if you're a big adult male, you only have yourself to worry about. You might go into the den as late as uh, December, and you may be able to come out and early March yeah sometimes uh, so as a general rule of thumb yeah pregnant females um, you know have the longest denning period and, and adult males have the uh, shortest denning period uh, you mentioned before um, that we saw four three five Holly and her two cubs today those are the only two uh, or that's the only family group that's that the only family group so and they came back this morning yes. they were observed okay. for the first time and she has yearling cubs so they're in their uh, second season and uh, back to hibernation, actually, mm -hmm. in the, the next one up in our, in okay. our queue here. So how do bears really know it's time to hibernate? It's a great question. <laughs> it can be several factors can come into play. One is uh, food availability. When there's no longer any food, uh, it's a good time to hibernate. Uh, there's also does tend to be some temperature correlation, but it's more just internal biology and uh, that tells them it's time to go into the den uh, and and temperature can play into that of course as well so I think food availability temperature yeah yeah all of those those are really kind of like all of the above with those reasons that <laughs> right. you gave uh, you know right now the bears are going to be entering you know hyperphagia that excessive eating period for them uh, but their metabolism will start to slow down mm -hmm you know, before they go um, to their denning site. So their uh, their hunger will eventually decrease. It's not like they're feeling that hung that urge to eat all the way up to the time that they enter their den. Right. Because that probably would keep them up and active on the landscape. But eventually it's their metabolism starts to slow down. Their heart rate starts to slow down mm -hmm. even before they go into the den. Although it doesn't really kind of bottom out until they're long into the den. Right. So a, a variety of factors. Uh, if, oops. Excuse me. Uh, so yeah, maybe it, it can be whether you're just full and that's that's enough for you. But there's also all of these unconscious changes right. that are happening. It's it's probably not a, a a conscious decision that the bears make. It's probably just like their body says, like we do at night at nighttime. True. I'm really tired. I gotta lay down. That's just what they what their bodies it's, are telling them too. Time to, yeah. yeah. I gotta lay down for six months instead <laughs> right. instead of eight hours. Exactly. <laughs> uh, can you speak to the fish counts that you're seeing this year um, and how that might be affecting the bear activity? We talked a little bit about this um, during the chat. Um, you know, in in July, we were seeing incredible numbers of, of sockeye salmon mm -hmm. at Brooks River. And that was kind of reflective just of the overall strength of the run in the Bristol Bay area. Right. You know, if you include like the whole Bristol Bay region in southwest uh, Alaska, it's... Uh, 
Uh, they were, what, it's like 62 million fish I or something like that? I think that was like the that? number. Uh, it's yeah. uh, historic proportions. Uh, it may, either the highest or right at the highest. It's it's historic. And over 2 million fish went into the Naknek River, and Brooks River is part of that watershed, and it gets about 20% of those fish. So, so that's 800,000, yeah. you know, in general. Yeah, so, so uh, a huge number of fish came into Brooks River, uh, with the silver salmon, you know, no one's really keeping close count on those. Uh, sure. I'm when I go to the falls, I do count, you know, occasionally how many fish I see jumping just to mm -hmm. get an idea uh, of What's how the that most you've seen per minute. Well, I, ha I I was just seeing a few per minute yesterday. Okay. I right. wasn't actually seeing too many, but um, okay. there were a few jumping per minute yesterday. The majority of the fish that I were seeing, like I mentioned before, were um, were silver salmon, and the majority right. of the fish that I were seeing bears catch at the falls were also silver salmon okay. too, which makes me think those are the fish that are primarily still migrating in the river. The sockeyes have kind of found their place to spawn. They're not doing as much jumping or trying to move beyond Brooks Falls. It's really those silver salmon. And if you could get a fresh silver salmon as opposed to a spawned out red, you're going to go for the silver, and I guess that's what the bears of the falls are doing. And it is starting to drizzle here a little bit. Um, you know, we do have some sensitive electronics outside right now. So <laughs> right. We'll, we'll see if it picks up. Um, so I, I do want to give you a word of warning in case we have to end the chat shortly. We'll try to stay with you um, as long as the weather uh, does allow, however. This is more typical. We've had an amazing stretch of weather here, about five, six days of sunshine in a row. Low winds. It's been utterly beautiful. After a so. very wet August, everyone says. Yeah, we <laughs> had, uh, I think, twice the average annual rainfall up through August so well I guess I picked a good time to not be here but <laughs> where I was actually it was it was very very smoky where I was so okay. sometimes I looked at the rain and I said you know what it would be really nice just to stand in some rain and not have to breathe <laughs> wildflowers sure. smoke uh, question about Otis Otis showed up yesterday mm -hmm. um, at uh, last evening at the falls uh -huh. um, he was on the cams earlier today okay will he ever come down river or does he just stay at Brooks Falls did, I'm trying to remember if I saw him downriver last year. It seems like he stays, I mean, he certainly could. Have you seen him downriver in previous years? Occasionally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, especially hmm. once the, the salmon fishing at Brooks Falls becomes l less productive, right. then he will move downriver. He's not a bear that I would consider to be very tolerant of, like, the people activity that mm -hmm. we have. Um, at the mouth of the river, uh, you right. know, there's a bridge here. If you're watching the lower river cameras, river watch or the lower river camera feed, there's a bridge here where people go across. Um, there's uh, vehicles that are driving around this area. So mm -hmm. that often can affect the, the movement and behavior of, of certain bears. So Otis doesn't seem to be like one of those bears that I have observed having a high tolerance for that. So I, I will see him mm -hmm. down here from time to time, but usually he tends to stick a little bit further up river. Uh, but th there's an area upstream of where we are, I'd say by water, if I was following the main channel, it's it's a quarter mile or so. Sure. And I'll, uh, some of those male bears that maybe don't come all the way down to the bridge will find opportunities to scavenge fish in that sort of like oxbow area. Right. That's upstream of, of where we are. Okay. Uh, question about a play fight um, or mm. maybe just some nuzzling that was happening. Um, mm. You know, recently people were seeing um, two... Two bears, um, a younger adult male, number 503, okay. and a older adult male, number 755, huh. kind of uh, nuzzling and rubbing their heads. Mm -hmm. um, is this a, a, a usual or unusual exchange between you know two two adult males? It's difficult to say. It's one of those questions we uh, you know we I wish depends. we could <laughs> yeah we could ask them like <laughs> right you know <laughs> hey. You just, uh, you guys just seemed like you wanted to, to play fight, but you didn't really just start wrestling. What was what was happening there? So, those, those that question is difficult difficult to answer. Um, and I'll tie into that with uh, 503. You know, 503 and 151 have been playing for over a year now, and about a week and a half ago, I saw them at the falls, and for the first time, it seemed like it changed from play into an actual dominance display fight. You know, for position. And that's interesting too. That play can sometimes turn into uh, eventual fighting. Right. It's like know? my brother and I, you know, <laughs> right. wrestle, and then he would get mad because I pulled a dirty move or something like that, and then we'd actually start fighting. <laughs> so I'm sure it happens with bears as it well. It seems to. It's it's less likely for or, or that um, 
mature and older adult males will play. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely within my observations, I see its play is uh, much more common with younger bears. Definitely. So 503 still being a young adult is much more apt to play. Also being very well fed, mm -hmm. I think factors into that. I think sure. if the bears didn't have access to as much food, they would be a little crankier, so to speak. And uh, maybe he just egged 755 into it, you know, right. and an adult <laughs> can still play from time to time. Uh, so here, um, one question about a new bridge. If you're um, not familiar with the sort of like the layout of Brooks River, there's a floating bridge across Brooks River, and the and the park is proposed to replace that, mm -hmm. um, and is going to begin construction on that this winter. Somebody was actually wondering, could you uh, point to where the new bridge will be? And I'm not sure if it's in our feed right now, but maybe you could explain where that new bridge sure. will, will go. Uh, you, and I'll step out of the frame. Can you see the second. floating bridge at all? So the floating bridge is here. The new bridge is still going to tie into the platform that we're on. So it's going to be in approximately the same area. Maybe the angle of it's going to bring it a little bit our direction. It's going to tie into the same platform. Uh, they'll deconstruct part of the platform, uh, but it's and then rebuild that. But it's basically going to be in about the same area. It's going to start a little bit earlier, all the way at the lodge. Uh, it's going to come across the river about midway between the platform we're on and the main platform if you've been here. And then the exit ramp will extend another 20 yards or so off the back. So, so almost the same area, just a little bit of a different angle coming in this way. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, you're welcome. So, uh, yeah, the, the, um, well, the lower river cameras will have to be deconstructed mm -hmm. um, probably sometime in early October, I think yeah. is what you're aiming for. Yep. Okay, so that's- By mid for sure. Yeah, so, um, and that's to protect the equipment that's here. So um, we may, you know, end up losing a little bit of that viewing time, but I think we're gonna try to make sure that the Brooks Falls cams stay live stay on. Uh, during during that time. Um, and next year uh, with the new bridge, you're gonna probably have maybe some different views. Uh, Certainly. Yeah, so uh, Explore.org is definitely talking with the park and, and thinking about how to um, utilize that that new structure to give um, viewers who who don't have the opportunity to visit some some really neat perspectives on the lower river area because oh, there will be yeah. more places to put cameras true yeah. and it'll help explore as far as set up and take down every year because that bridge will be permanent and it'll make life I mean they'll <laughs> maybe new things we're unaware of but overall it should make the operation even more smooth there's one thing that um, you might have to do or Andrew might have to do <laughs> is take the underwater camera off mm -hmm. and I remember doing that in years past and you know you try to get into the water in in October or something like that and the water is really cold mm -hmm. I didn't remember doing it one time it was snowing oh so my. I had a dry suit on and I had all this like uh, you know thermal layers underneath but I was still pretty pretty cold when I got out well, that's gonna be tough for Andrew to do <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so there yeah I mean there, uh, so uh, there will be um, some changes coming up um, this fall and throughout throughout the winter time. So uh, the the number one factor that affects the longevity of the cams in the fall, though, is weather. Mm -hmm. uh, if if it snows, if it's cloudy all the time, there's just not a lot of sunlight to power right. these cameras that are powered by solar. True. Uh, so so if there's not a lot of sunlight, then the falls cams can can kind of go black early. It's just because there's not enough I don't enough juice for them. So that right. that could happen as well. Uh, but we'll keep them up as long as possible. And uh, somebody's wondering about 151. There's a bear with a big kind of flap oh, hanging yeah. off of his. Uh, yeah. He has one on his hip there. Uh, do, you have, do we have any idea what may have caused that? No, we can only conjecture. Yeah, some people say uh, it couldn't have been caused by a fight. It sure looks to me like it could have been caused by a fight. Uh, maybe he's turning away from a bear. A bear gives that last, you know, is holding on and pulls it off. It, it could have come off in some other way. The bottom line is those wounds can look really nasty, and if they were on a person, they'd probably get horribly infected and cause a lot of problems, and how bears can manage wounds like that and just keep rolling is really remarkable they just, to me. Yeah, they just put up with it. They do. It is really amazing how tough they are, <laughs> and that, that, act, that wound on 151 is actually a fairly minor wound mm -hmm. compared to what we've seen on bears before. That's right. So, so uh, if you're worried about him, um, I'm sure it's not comfortable for him, but that's a fairly minor thing, and I expect that he'll heal fairly well from that. Watching him continue to fight with other bears, it, it doesn't seem to be bothering him <laughs> right, at he, all. <laughs> he's up at the falls. He's doing his normal thing. He's still mm -hmm. play fighting. He's still catching fish. Uh, with 
that the position of his wound really does uh, make me suspect that it was caused by another bear, mm -hmm. um, because sometimes bears will run away from another one. Right. One will come up and squat up, up that from last, behind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, there's, I mean, it, it could be injured in, in a variety of ways, but most of the injuries that we see on bears are caused by other bears. Mm -hmm. So I really do believe that probably that was. probably was was caused by another bear. And uh, somebody's wondering what the large white thing is right behind us. What is oh, that, Russ? <laughs> this is your camera. So this is the explore.org, one of the cameras, the uh, lower river camera. And inside this white housing is the camera itself. And so there's a person remotely controlling this. One of the volunteers with explore.org could be anywhere on the earth. And they're going to do their best to follow the bears around the lower river. So this is your camera right here if you're watching the lower river cam. And a uh, 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 related question to the bridge. Um, so somebody's wondering, since this is, the lower river is a productive place in the fall for bears to fish, will the new bridge help or hurt the bears fishing in this area? You know, it's, it's, um, it's not going to completely eliminate our impacts on the bears. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, it will make crossing the river more convenient. It will reduce some of the sort of like conflicts for space mm -hmm. that people and bears experience here, uh, especially, you know, crossing the bridge. We're in the bears habitat. We're going to be over the bears habitat once the bridge is built. Right. Uh, however, the presence of people does alter the behavior uh, of, of bears. Mm -hmm. um, so in my opinion, um, it, it, it will be of benefit in some ways, but definitely will. It does have the potential to alter um, the movement and behavior of bears the same way that people do um, right now. So difficult question to answer may not be something that we can answer until we have several years of, of data. And uh, watching it, one thing I can say is it's not the reason the bridge is being built, but one of the side effects of the new bridge. Right now, dead salmon often get caught underneath this floating bridge, so we do find bears uh, uh, fishing sort of underneath trying to grab dead fish from under the bridge with the new bridge being elevated and on on pilings it'll there'll be less of that so that will be one alteration is there'll probably be fewer bears right at the bridge fishing you know so but uh is that bad or good not necessarily either one i mean they'll just find a different way to fish and they'll adapt to the difference yeah so and a lot of the bears that we see down at the mouth of, of brooks river or in the lower river area are, already show a fairly high level of habituation to people mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean all bears here at brooks river are tolerant of the presence of people that's right and this you know if you're a long time viewer of the cams you probably have heard me uh, talk about this before uh, but when you come to brooks river uh, you know if you're planning a trip here i really do want you to consider how you can visit this place with um, and lessen your impact on the animals. Mm -hmm. um, because there are bears that need to use this place that don't have that tolerance of people that someone like 410 does. Right. Um, so when people are everywhere, if we're noisy along the river, then we have the potential to really sort of displace those bears from the river. That's right. It's not necessarily like in, or increasing the, the risk to us. It's not mm -hmm. like it's more dangerous to be around those non-human habituated bears. Mm -hmm. It's more like, hey, we're where the bears want to feed. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that we're reducing that impact so the bears have spaces or space to get to the resources they need to survive. That's right. Because it's a kind of a vacation for a lot of us, but it's really where these bears need to be. These bears that are fishing here in the fall maybe don't have another place to go. Right. Sometimes people will say that. They'll say, oh, yeah, well, you know what? That bear has to leave Brooks River, no big deal. But they may not know of mm -hmm. another place to go at this time of the year. So, right. yeah, I ask everyone who, who wants to come here to just think about that carefully. How can you reduce your impact on, on the wildlife? Uh, what Russ and I like to do is we like to stand on the wildlife viewing platforms mm -hmm. to view bears most often. That's right. Um, because this is a 